All right, so usually I start this talk with a whole spiel about who I am and what I do, but you guys have a fairly good idea of what that is. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about, uh, about the situation in Russia, which is not very far away. Uh, and I'm sure that you're all aware that the amount of censorship and surveillance of uh, Russian dissidents and activists has definitely gone up uh, in, in recent years. So without further ado, let's figure out how these things work. So between the dissolution of the Soviet Union in uh, 1990, uh, right around the time of the invention of the World Wide Web, and about 2011, the year leading up to uh, Putin's re-election as president, the internet in Russia was a mostly uncensored public space, uh, especially compared to newspapers, radio, and television. There was no great firewall of the kind that you see in China or the kind that's under development in Iran, well, what they call the halal internet. Uh, if you wanted to post to the internet in Russia, you didn't have to walk through this flow chart that you see here to see if the government was sensitive enough about your post that they're likely to censor you. Uh, this is a little flow chart explaining uh, how Chinese people think about their internet posts before they post something. And as you can see, it's extremely complicated. Uh, so um, the RUNET is where Russia's civil society gathered to discuss politics and air their grievances. In 2004, only a minority of Russians, 8% of the population, had internet access. Uh, in 2008, uh, about 32.7 million users in Russia had access to the internet, which is about 30% of the population. And by 2012, uh, which we will talk about as like a big turning point in Russia, 75.9 million Russians, or about 50% of the population, uh, had access to the internet. In late 2011, and again in early 2012, tens of thousands of Russians took to the streets to protest electoral fraud in the Putin regime. These were the biggest demonstrations Russia had seen since the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, this uh, woman has the tape over her face that says, no voice. Uh, social media played a key role in organizing these protests, and the blogger Alexei Navalny uh, emerged as one of the leaders of the opposition movement. So this is just a quick photo to give you some idea of how big these protests were. They're a pretty big deal. That is the whole street full. It's a giant boulevard and it just sort of keeps going. This guy right here is uh, Alexei Navalny. Uh, so Navalny uh, is a key figure in organizing these massive street protests. He was a lawyer and anti-corruption blogger. Um, he ran a website on the popular blogging for, uh, platform LiveJournal. Uh, how many of you know what LiveJournal is? How many of you used to have a LiveJournal? How many of you still update your LiveJournal? One, one, two. I'm amazed. This is two more than I ever see in a normal audience. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what happened to LiveJournal later. Um, but LiveJournal was probably the first online threat to, the, uh, to its authority that the Kremlin took seriously enough to act. Uh, Navalny would go on to found the Opposition Progress Party and run for mayor of Moscow in 2013, winning 27% of the vote, which doesn't seem very impressive unless you consider the fact that he was you know, an outspoken opponent of the Putin regime. Uh, he should have gotten 0% of the vote. Um, in return, he's been heavily surveilled. Uh, Navalny pub uh, published pictures of the listening devices he's found in his office. He's been threatened. And uh, he and his brother Oleg were uh, made the target of at least two politically motivated embezzlement cases, one in uh, 2012 and another one this year. Uh, most recently, a Russian court has handed down a guilty verdict and placed, placed Navalny under house arrest while his brother is uh, serving a 3.5 year uh, prison sentence. Uh, this is actually a sort of revival of, uh, of an old Soviet tactic, which was, oh, we'll let you go, but we will essentially keep somebody from your family as a hostage. So this is, uh, this is a, a sort of web capture of a protest site. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, bill number 89417-6, they don't really have catchy names for their bills in the Duma, uh, partially because everything having to do with censoring the internet gets passed through pretty quickly. Um, so 
This was a proposal in the Duma from the summer of 2012, uh, shortly after these you know, big protests are happening in the streets, uh, that created the, the first uh, major expansion of the internet blacklist. Uh, the Justice Ministry already ran this like small blacklist of extremist materials banned by courts. And that was websites and offline pop, uh, publications, as well as musical recordings and leaflets. Um, and so this was a list that, for all of these things, had 1,199 entries. The new law proposed a digital blacklist of websites with a .ru domain name that contain pornography, host drug advertisements, condone suicide, or include extremist ideas, purportedly to protect the children. Now, this is another thing that you're going to see over and over again, uh, not just in uh, Russian political discourse, but uh, it's something that I've seen very often in American discourse, which is that we need to censor the internet in order to protect the children. We need to increase, increase surveillance in order to protect the children. Uh, this is a, a sad and, and facile argument uh, that uh, governments come back to all the time. Um, opponents expressed uh, concern about the lack of effectiveness, the burden on internet intermediaries. Uh, that would be uh, the people who run websites. If you host your own blog and you allow comments on that blog, you are an internet intermediary. Um, furthermore, nearly all of us post content to the internet through internet intermediaries, like Facebook or Twitter or Blogger. Uh, very few of us are running our own web servers and posting things directly to them ourselves. Maybe in this crowd, I don't know. Um, so, and the other thing that they worried about was the lack of oversight and accountability. Uh, that. Uh, would leave the blacklist open to abuse. And I think you'll see later that the uh, blacklist was wildly abused. Um, inspired by similar protests against internet censorship bills, including SOPA PIPA. I don't know how many of you remember SOPA PIPA from 2012, uh, but it was a very bad internet censorship bill um, in, in the United States. And their premise for, uh, their reason for uh, needing to censor the internet was intellectual property law, uh, which is an argument that you will see uh, used just slightly less often than protecting the children, um, but definitely is, is in the running for the argument I'm most sick of. Uh, and also the um, DDL, Intercettazioni, I can't pronounce anything in Italian, in Italy. Um, Prominent Russian websites uh, staged a blackout protest. So this is uh, Wikipedia's uh, blackout page explaining that they have blacked out their site and the reason you're not seeing Wikipedia today is that they're protesting this law in the Duma. This is LiveJournal's blackout page. Uh, so we talked a little bit about, uh, about LiveJournal. Uh, what's particularly interesting about LiveJournal is uh, that it was a very early blogging platform, started in 1999 by a guy named uh, Brad Fitzpatrick. Um, this is particularly close to my heart because uh, Brad lived in San Francisco, and this was very much a sort of, you know, San Francisco, California, Silicon Valley company. Uh, he sold his company to Six Apart in 2005, and then, um, it was sold to a Russian company, uh, SUP Services, in 2007. Uh, LiveJournal was an extremely popular blogging platform in Russia because it was one of the few uh, platforms to have support for Cyrillic fonts. Again, fonts are strangely important. Uh, and the only reason that they had such early support for Cyrillic was because Brad thought Cyrillic looked cool. Here's the Russian Duma overwhelmingly approving the controversial internet regulation bill, 89417-6. Um, a total of 441 out of 450 deputies representing all four party factions within the Duma voted to support the bill. Everybody wants to protect the children. In the final reading, the Duma removed the portion of the bill uh, that criminalized extremist, uh, extremist online content. And it's possible that this may have been a small victory for the internet blackout um, websites, including Wikipedia and LiveJournal. Um, however, the Duma gave preliminary approval um, the week before to an anti-libel and slander bill uh, that designated many uh, rights and campaign NGOs as foreign agents. Uh, 
this bill would later be passed and used against organizations like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. And it also passed a law that increased fines for public protesters. Even the blackout's small victory was soon blotted out. Uh, by the end of 2013, uh, Roskomnadzor, uh, which is the uh, censorship body, the internet censorship body in Russia, you're going to be hearing this name a lot. Uh, people who do not speak Russian have great difficulty pronouncing it. Um, Roskomnadzor's powers were expanded to allow it to block any content it deemed harmful or illegal without a court order. Prime Minister Medvedev promoted the ruling at a meeting with, uh, United Russia, with the United Russia Party leadership in Moscow and stated that the internet should be regulated by a set of rules which mankind has yet to work out. And it's a very difficult process because we can not regulate everything, nor can we leave the internet outside the legal realm. Um, these remarks are very much at odds with Medvedev's speech in, say, 2011, before the 2012 protests, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, where he said, Russia will not support initiatives that put in doubt freedom on the internet, freedom which is based on the requirements of morality and law. At the United Russia meeting, Medvedev also talked about the basic rights and freedoms, such as the right to be protected against harmful content which is a right I was not previously aware of. And that gives you some idea of how the Kremlin was reframing censorship using the language of human rights. In March 2014, Rodskamnadzor uh, used these anti-extremist powers to block major independent news sites, including the banned sites uh, such as the newspaper Grani, uh, Gary Kasparov's opposition information site, uh, Kasparov.ru, uh, the live journal of popular anti-corruption crusader Alexei Navalny, uh, and even the web pages of uh, Ekomaskoy, uh, which is a radio station. See, the, the small children find this upsetting. Um, <laughs> which is majority owned by state-run Gazprom, and whose independent editor was ousted uh, about a month before this and replaced with a more government-friendly fr director. And what you're going to see over and over again, as I sort of describe this rapidly closing media space, is uh, that it's not good enough to oust the leadership of these companies. Uh, that uh, if you give the Kremlin an inch, they will take a mile. Russia's prosecutor general announced that the news sites had been entered into the single register and banned information after calls for participation in unauthorized rallies. Navalny's live journal was apparently added to the register in response to, his, to the conditions of his house arrest, which included a personal prohibition against accessing the internet. Uh, Navalny's uh, independent website is uh, supposedly run by his wife for this reason. Uh, Navalny later moved his site off of LiveJournal entirely and maintains a standalone blog, uh, which is called Navalny.com. In December of 2014, Russia threatened to block all of American news site BuzzFeed. How many of you here are familiar with BuzzFeed? Ah, well, there we go. Um, BuzzFeed is usually uh, cute little lists uh, and GIFs of people rolling their eyes, uh, but occasionally they do, uh, they do print some news. Um, <laughs> so in this particular case, uh, they had uh, written a post about a deadly gunfight in the capital of Chechnya. Uh, BuzzFeed received an email from Radzkomnadzor um, saying that the post contained appeals to mass riots, extremist activities, or participation in mass public actions held with infringement of the established order. Uh, Russian legalese is a particularly stultifying language. Um, it cited statutes laid out by the prosecutor's general's office and said access to, this, uh, to the site is restricted by communication service providers in the territory of the Russian Fed Federation. It gave BuzzFeed 24 hours to remove the post or face a total ban. The article uh, reports, uh, sorry, the article included reports, video, and social media posts to tell the story of a shootout between Islamist rebels in Grozny, the Chechen capital, and Russian troops. The attack was the largest in years in the Chechen capital, which had been rebuilt by Chechen's authoritarian ruler uh, a few years before. The story included a video uh, uh, hosted on YouTube by Kavkaz Center, uh, Caucasian Center. Uh, the rebel's online mouthpiece, which uh, is banned in Russia. Uh, 
YouTube took the video down and then BuzzFeed removed the video from the report um, because it had been taken down and uh, Razkamnadzor relented and did not in fact block all of BuzzFeed. Uh, Russia was free to look at uh, lists of adorable cat gifts once more. Also in December, uh, Russia's uh, regulator briefly blocked GitHub. How many of you here are familiar with GitHub? Everybody. Then you understand that blocking GitHub is kind of a big deal uh, in, in the sense that if you go after one tiny little bit of GitHub, what you're actually doing is you're, uh, you are interrupting a whole lot of people's coding projects, up to and including mine. Um, so Radzkomnadzor briefly blocked GitHub after the popular software and coding collaboration platform was found to be hosting content related to suicide, specifically a file that details 32 ways to kill yourself. Uh, the block effectively am amounted to an order to ISPs to restrict access to the entire site because GitHub works exclusively on HTTPS. How many of you here are familiar with HTTPS? All right, so you've just saved me the trouble of having to explain why if you want to block one site on a site, you don't, you have to block the whole thing. Yes, we're good. Yes. Um, so providers could only comply by restricting access to the, insire, to the entire site rather than individual pages. Uh, Russia rescinded the block under the impression that the page had been taken down. Um, but all that GitHub had done was uh, restricted the files and repositories uh, to be blocked for Russian IP space. In, on April 22nd, 2014, Russia's uh, Duma adopted amendments to counterterrorism legislation, including a new law on internet users called bloggers. The law requires, required bloggers with more than 3,000 daily visitors online to register with Rodskamnadzor, the state body for media oversight. Uh, once registered, bloggers uh, would have the same legal constraints and responsibilities as mass media outlets, including verifying information for accuracy, indicating the minimal age for users, protecting information pertaining to people's privacy, and being subject to restrictions on propaganda in support of electoral candidates. Bloggers uh, would also be held responsible for any comments posted by third parties on their web page or social media page. Uh, this is called uh, intermediary liability. So if any of you here have ever hosted a, uh, a website that had comments on it, um, you understand that you actually have no power over these comments. And so if you are, um, are risking the possibility that you may be sued or held criminally liable over the comments that somebody else posts to your website, you're much less likely to host comments on your website at all. So this has a tremendous chilling effect on free speech. Uh, according to the new law, bloggers registered in the 3,000 visitors category also needed to provide their real last name, initials, and contact details on their websites or pages. Again, uh, getting rid of the, the power of anonymous speech also has a tremendous chilling effect on free speech. Uh, failing to do this, uh, Radzkam Nadzor um, could... Uh, fail Failure by bloggers to register with Radzkam or to provide contact information um, would be punishable by administrative fines between 10 and 30,000 rubles. I have this written down as somewhere between 280 and 840 uh, US dollars, but the ruble has actually dropped a whole lot since then. So let's just go with a significant sum of money. Repeated violations occur, incur higher fines, up to 50,000 rubles for individuals and up to 500,000 rubles for legal entities, or administrative suspension of the site for up to one month. The term blogger is defined broadly and could include anyone who posts on microblogs or Twitter um, or social networks. So basically anybody even with a social networking site. Uh, raise your hand here if you have a Twitter account. Raise your hand if you have a Facebook account. Congratulations, Russia believes you are a blogger. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have more than 3,000 visitors or subscribers to either one of these accounts. Uh, no, not that many. Uh, anyway, uh, Russia would like you to please register your name um, with the government so that they can hold you accountable. Um, what's particularly interesting about this law was that Russia applied it not only to blogs and uh, social media accounts being um, 
being run inside of Russia, uh, but also to accounts that were uh, tweeting or writing primarily in Russian for, and I quote, a Russian audience. Probably not anybody who's here. Uh, in addition, blogging services and social networks uh, were required to store user activity for six months, raising privacy concerns by making it easier for uh, authorities to identify users. This is known as Russia's data localization law. So Ru Russia's data localization law will not go into effect until September of 2015. It's already been delayed. I think it was originally supposed to go into effect in January of this year. Uh, but companies are already under immense pressure to make a decision about whether to stay or go. Uh, Google, for example, has pulled its engineers out of Moscow. Uh, Facebook maintains some presence in Russia. Uh, Twitter has no presence in Russia at this time. Uh, and one of the reasons why this is a very important consideration is because if you are an internet intermediary and you're facing this increasingly uh, draconian set of laws, uh, every user, or sorry, every, every employee that you have located inside of the country is a potential hostage. This here is a screenshot from uh, Google's uh, transparency report from the second half of 2013. Uh, it describes a request from the Ministry of Internal Affairs to remove eight Play Store apps based on the Fortress of the Muslim, a Muslim prayer book. The book was found to be extremist uh, by the Russian government and added to the Russian federal list of extremist materials. Google uh, received this request and restricted access to the eight apps in Russia. So if you were coming from an, a Russian IP address, you could no longer uh, download the apps uh, that would allow you to read this book. So having passed legal tools with which to affect internet censorship, Russia has been flexing its muscle at internet companies based mostly in the US, so companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter. Um, Google reports uh, that it is receiving increasing numbers of takedown requests from Rudskomnadzor. Uh, Google's latest transparency report, again, from the second half of 2013, they'd really better hurry up and bring these things up to date. I don't have forever. Uh, shows uh, much higher numbers than, than in previous years. Uh, they say they, request, uh, they received 235 requests and court orders. Um, to remove 235 blog posts, Google Play apps, YouTube videos, and images that allegedly contain content in violation of the federal law on information, information technologies, and information protection. Google says that they removed 115 items of content for violating product policies and restricted 84 items from local view. Uh, so if you're coming from a Russian IP, you cannot see these things. This is fine if you're using some sort of internet circumvention technology. Um, which we'll get to later. Uh, the number of content removal requests, according to them, that they, re uh, they received increased by 125% compared to the previous reporting period. One third of these items that were taken down were taken down for quote unquote national security reasons. Now, again, we've talked a little bit about the history of, uh, of Russian internet censorship, and we know that uh, 2012 and 2013 were actually just ramping up periods. 2014 was completely crazy. So I'm fairly certain that in the next Google transparency report, you will find that the numbers are even higher. In 2012, uh, Twitter announced in a blog post that it was launching a system that would allow the company to take down content on a country by country basis, as opposed to taking it down across the entire Twitter network. Uh, this is a, a sort of geographic blocking capability uh, that Google already had and was using. Um, when Twitter did this, EFF was very concerned, but we defended that decision as the least terrible option. After all, when a company refuses to comply, uh, with an official government request, the government's response is often to block the entire platform. So they get a request from the Russian government. The Russian government says, you know, block this thing. Uh, they say, no, we don't want to block this thing. And suddenly all of Twitter is blocked in Russia. So they've got these uh, geo-blocking capabilities. Uh, we pointed out that companies cannot be compelled to follow court orders from countries where they do not have significant assets or employees. So we wouldn't expect that Twitter would comply uh, with court orders unless they were coming from the United Kingdom, Ireland, Japan, or Germany, which is the places where they, uh, where they had offices. 
but we also warned them that if you build it, they will come. Meaning that if you build a system for country by country internet censorship, countries will inevitably try to make use of it. And we called on users to remain vigilant uh, using projects like Chilling Effects. How many of you here are familiar with Chilling Effects? Not very many? All right. So uh, www.chillingeffects.org uh, is a uh, website where uh, Twitter, Google, and Wikipedia send all uh, copies of all of their takedown requests. And so if you see a specific uh, piece of content taken down on any one of these sites, you can actually go look it up on Chilling Effects and see what, the, uh, what kind of court order came in that led to, to this data no longer being online. This gives you a lot of in insight into how uh, internet censorship works. Uh, and you can see that a lot of the internet censorship is not really national security based, but mostly based around uh, intellectual property law. Um, Who created that, the chilling effect I initiative? Uh, well, for a while, EFF was if one of okay the hosts. If it's okay if I interrupt you. Oh, please. For a while, EFF was one of the hosts of chilling effects, uh, but it's currently an independent organization. So. Last year, uh, when Twitter users in Russia tried to view the account belonging to right sector, Pravoy Sektor, uh, the nationalist political party characterized by the Russian government as neo-Nazi fascists, uh, which is also how the Russian uh, government characterizes pretty much everybody in Ukraine, um, they were greeted with a message that reads, Pravoy uh, Sektor was withheld. The ca this account has been withheld in Russia. Um, officials at Twitter, uh, confirmed that, uh, that they uh, blocked the account due to a request from Rudskomnadzor. Um, and this is particularly disturbing, not because this was the first time that Twitter had ever, uh, had ever blocked an account uh, in response to a Russian request, but, but this was the first time that they had blocked an explicitly political account. Um, furthermore, uh, this was not even an account that was located inside of Russia. This was a Ukrainian account tweeting from Ukraine, though of course this is a you know, matter of, of uh, great uh, disagreement between Russia and Ukraine right now, exactly where Russia is and exactly where Ukraine is. Um, so Twitter said that they received 17 requests from the Federal Service for uh, supervision of the sphere of telecom information technologies and mass communication regarding content determined to violate uh, the federal law. Um, and that uh, they took down uh, 13 accounts that were uh, supposedly promoting drug use or suicide. But really what we're very worried about is this sort of taking down of political content. Um, yes. To respond like this or do this in any other market? Absolutely. Right around the same time, uh, Twitter took down uh, content in Pakistan uh, in response to what they thought was a valid court order. Uh, though when the Pakistani uh, civil liberties group, Bolo B, took a look at the order, they realized that it was not in fact a valid court order, that the law did not in fact allow the government uh, to take down uh, this kind of content, and uh, Twitter put the content back up. But it's really disturbing that civil society had to take a look at the takedown, uh, which they would have never gotten a look at if Twitter had not contributed to, uh, to uh, chilling effects. Um, and furthermore, it's very disturbing that Twitter does not have a Pakistani lawyer on staff who could uh, figure out whether or not this was a valid legal request. If you're going to be taking legal requests from other countries, the least you can do is have a lawyer on staff that understands the law in that country. Eva, very, very basic questions, but how do, how do you actually approach Twitter in a case like this? How, who do you actually turn to to say, we have a legal court order, please t take this content down. Uh, there is uh, an abuse, uh, there is a, an abuse point person at Twitter, and that is the, uh, that is the person who receives all of the, um, all of the takedown uh, requests. And uh, Twitter also has a transparency report, so they, they do report on how much is taken down, what countries are asking for these kinds of takedowns. Uh, behind Google, Twitter was like really one of the, the pioneers of transparency reporting. So two weeks ago, just in case you thought that this had stopped or slowed down in some way, um, a 65-page report titled Putin, colon, War, 
uh, based on materials gathered by the recently assassinated Boris Nemtsov, Russia's former deputy prime minister and outspoken critic of the Kremlin, was published, allegedly demonstrating that Russian troops have indeed invaded Ukraine, a fact obvious to anybody who's been living in Ukraine, and that at least 220 active soldiers have died uh, during the fighting. 2,000 copies were printed and distributed to journalists and opposition leaders, and within days of publication, the PayPal account raising money for a wider distribution of the report was suspended. PayPal uh, sent, a, sent a message uh, to Vsevolod uh, Chagayev, who is the guy running the PayPal account, uh, explaining that his account was blocked because the service does not support political fundraising. This is bullshit. PayPal does support fundraising. It has a special service specifically dedicated to accepting political donations. It offers customizable donate buttons for fundraisers to put on websites. When questioned by CNN Money, PayPal blamed overbearing Russian regulation and an inability to track who's actually giving the money. They said, PayPal Russia does not currently allow any political parties or political causes in Russia to receive donations due to the complexity of complying with the local rules which require validating the identity of donors. <sighs> now, PayPal already collects additional information from anyone who uses its system. Like any bank or money transferring business, PayPal abides by strict anti-money laundering regulations. That's why the company, it says, it demands documents to prove your uh, address, phone number, email address, and at times a bank account number and social security number. PayPal did not clarify why identifying donors in Russia was such a difficult task. Anyway, what we, the conclusion that we can really all come to here is that uh, their decision to block, this, um, to block this account was largely a political one. Now, when it comes to financial censorship, PayPal is an old hand. They've done this before. In 2012, uh, PayPal famously shut off the ability for people to support WikiLeaks the rogue journalistic outfit that reveals government and corporate secrets, such as the killing of journalists by American soldiers in Iraq. Uh, in that case, PayPal froze the account of the German foundation accepting Wiki WikiLeaks donations. Um, last year, PayPal temporarily froze donations to Proton Mail, a startup that sought to create a secure private email service in the wake of the NSA domestic surveillance scandal. I know about this because I have a Proton Mail account and I sent them money. Russian social media companies that failed to comply rapidly enough with the Kremlin's increasingly high-handed demands for censorship and surveillance pay the price. Vkontakte, founded in 2006 by Pavel Durov, is a powerful Russian language competitor to Facebook, boasting 280 million accounts and 70 million daily users. It is the second most visited website in Russia after Yandex, the search engine, and is available in Russian, English, and Ukrainian. Durov had been playing a game of brinksmanship with the Kremlin for a long time. In December 2011, demanding that he take down contacted pages being uh, used to organize protests opposing the re-election of Vladimir Putin, um, including pages administered by Alexei Navalny. Um, rather than heed those orders to block them from the internet, Durov pushed back. The day after receiving the letter, he beefed up the site so that it could ac accommodate even more posts per page. The same day, he tweeted a picture of the letter, along with text that translates the official response to a request for special services blocking groups. Here is the picture of a dog that he tweeted. In January 2012, uh, Durov made the business case in the as yet unblocked independent newspaper Lienta. And for a while, it seemed like the Kremlin was going, to was going to leave Kontakte alone. So what Durov says is, if foreign sites continue to exist in a free field and Russia begins to censor, the Runet can expect only a slow death. It is pointless to remove from one website what can quickly be found on another. In other words, if you force me to censor, I can't compete with Facebook. You're going to lose money. Leave me alone. But in early 2013, Durov's troubles with the government started to pick up again. In March, uh, the Russian news outlet Novaya Gazeta uh, published what it claims were a series of hacked emails between Durov and the Kremlin's chief ideologist, Vladislav Surkov, uh, suggesting that Vkontakte had been working with the FSB for years already. Then, on April 5th, the state prosecutor's office launched a criminal investigation into charges that Durov had run over a policeman's foot while driving a white Mercedes registered to Ilya Pirikovsky, 
a contact of a vice president, a claim that Duroff calls completely fake. One moment. And did, did that... Did they press charges against him for that um, car accident? As a matter of fact, less than two weeks later, investigators came to the Vkontakte headquarters and seized Vkontakte's pub, uh, company files and servers. The day after that, Durov woke up to the news that two of his original investors had sold their joint 48% stake in the company, then valued at $2 billion to United Capital Partners, a private Moscow investment firm with close ties to the Kremlin. Having lost control of his company, Durov fled Russia, only returning in June 2013 when the charges were downgraded to a fine. Durov later published a letter originally, uh, allegedly from the FSB, dated December of 2013, demanding the identities and personal data of users that were moderating 25 groups supporting the Euromaidan protest movement in Ukraine. Uh, some of the pages were for local Euromaidan groups, uh, including uh, cities in... Uh, Eastern Ukraine and Lviv in Western Ukraine. So even if Russia was going all crazy and saying that, East, that Eastern Ukraine belonged to them, uh, they wanted information about, um, about users that were definitely outside of the territory that it was totally not invading. Uh, Durov claims that he refused the request. He said giving out personal data of Ukrainians to Russian authorities would not only be a violation of the law, but a betrayal of millions of residents of Ukraine who trusted us. And he charges that, uh, he says that the FSB uh, charges of cooperation uh, were basically a smear campaign. By January 14th, it looks like Durov had no financial control over, over Vkontakte anymore, which was entirely in the hands of uh, Putin cronies. He stayed on as general director and continued to post videos, such as this one, entitled Fear is Not Real, this is a, a still from it, uh, in support of Ukraine on his Vkontakte page. Um, but by April of this year, uh, he'd been fired from Vkontakte. Uh, he fled Russia for New York and says he has no plans to return. It's safe to, uh, to assume that Vkontakte has been completely co-opted and is cooperating fully with the Kremlin at this time. Just to stress again, which was the Russian Facebook, which had over 200 million users, which was the sort of daily social media platform for most Russian people. Yes, it's kind of a big deal. So now we're going to talk about surveillance. Uh, because I work for EFF, I talk a lot about surveillance. And usually when we talk about surveillance, we're talking about mass surveillance, spying on everybody all over the world, all the time, by default, also known as dragnet surveillance. And you would think that Russia has this capability, but they don't. Uh, Russia's internet surveillance infrastructure is intrusive and, most worryingly, has almost no oversight or accountability. Um, Collection requires a court order, but these are secret and not shown to the service provider. And, uh, but this is not mass surveillance yet. Let there be no question that the Russian government would like mass surveillance. It's just that it's very technically complicated and they haven't quite gotten there yet. Uh, the primary difference between the NSA surveillance and FSB surveillance is the difference between I am spying on everyone all the time and I can spy on anyone at any time. According to Russia's Supreme Court, uh, the number of intercepted telephone conversations and email messages um, almost doubled in the six years between 2007 and 2012, from 265,937 to 539,864. And again, we've been talking about this sort of ramp up in censorship. Uh, I think we've seen uh, sort of parallel ramp up in surveillance. And so it is safe to assume that the numbers have gotten much, much higher since 2012. How is this done? SWARM. Russia's SWARM, which is uh, literally the system for operative investigative activities, is a, the lawful interception system operated by the Federal Security Service. The FSB has control centers connected directly to operators' uh, computer servers. To monitor particular phone conversations or internet communications, an FSB agent has only to enter a command into the control center located in the local FSB headquarters. This system is replicated across the country. In every Russian town, there are protected underground cables which control the local FSB bureau, um, which, which connect the local FSB bureau with all internet service providers and telecom providers in the region. Um, ISPs are required not only to install these SORM boxes, but to pay for them the themselves. This is a little bit like the Chinese habit of, of uh, executing people and then billing their family for the bullet. 
Storm received a major upgrade before the Sochi Olympic Games, where reports claimed that all communication and internet traffic by Sochi residents was captured and filtered through deep packet inspection systems at all mobile networks, which allowed them the capability uh, to search for specific keywords. This is not something that Russia is able to do all the way across the country, but this is definitely sort of a glimpse of what the future of, uh, of Russian uh, internet surveillance may be like. Uh, SORM differs from the US lawful interception system uh, because once the FSB receives approval for access to a target's communications, they're able to unilaterally tap into the system without provider awareness. Supposedly, the FSB is required to get a court order, but they're not obliged to show it to anyone, and the ISP may not even ask to see it. In 2000, Putin expanded access to SORM beyond the FSB to include seven additional agencies, including the police, Border Patrol and Customs, and the tax police. SORM is also lawfully used to target opposition parties within Russia. According to the World Policy Institute in November 12, uh, 2012, Russia's Supreme Court upheld the right of authorities to eavesdrop on the opposition. In 2014, Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev signed a decree, N743, again, they don't really have very catchy names, um, that will extend the use of SORM to the monitoring of social media platforms, including social networking websites and other services uh, that allow you to establish a communication between two users. Supposedly, this means that Facebook, Google, and Twitter will soon be required to install SORM boxes for, lo for local lawful access or risk having their services blocked. Um, as far as we know, uh, this is not yet happening and there is not yet a, uh, a deadline by which they need to comply. Uh, but in the past, as, with the, uh, as is the case with the data localization law, uh, the stuff just sort of gets, the, the can gets kicked down the road. Yandex, Mail.ru, Vkontakte, Odnoklasniki, which means classmates, uh, LiveJournal, uh, may all have fought back in small ways. But Duroff is a strong object lesson. If you fight back, you will be crushed. Many of these companies are now controlled by uh, Putin allies, and there's no reason to believe that this trend will abate. If you're communicating using Russian-based services, assume that the data is available in real time to the FSB and the seven other agencies, um, or anyone who can afford to bribe them. So, will crypto save us? Encryption in transit won't save us if we're using Russian tools. Using HTTPS all the time protects your data while it's traveling over the network, but it's still readable by the service or website. If your service is compromised, your data is compromised. However, when using non-Russian services, HTTPS everywhere is a good idea. HTTPS is a browser extension built by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which works with either your uh, Mozilla or Chrome browser to make sure that if a site supports HTTPS, that it is doing so by default. Uh, it also has an option called um, HTTP Nowhere, uh, which will actually not allow you to browse sites in straight HTTP. Uh, this also means that the uh, Russian government will, oh sorry, um, if you're building a service aimed at a Russian audience, consider using HTTPS by default. This also means that the, the Russian government will need to risk blocking your entire website rather than blocking a specific page. This is a, a very powerful censorship argument um, which was uh, originally put forth by uh, Ethan Zuckerman who I think is, was working for MIT at the time. Uh, and uh, he calls this the cute cat, uh, cute cat theory of internet censorship. Um, and what he posits is that most people who use the internet are not in fact using it to organize revolutions or protests. Most people are using it to browse pornography or post pictures of cute cats. And so if you block somebody's you know, revolutionary organizing, almost nobody will care. But if you block people's access to their pictures of cute cats, there will be riots in the streets. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about censorship circumvention, since we're seeing increased censorship all over Russia. Um, what I recommend that people do in Russia is uh, to purchase a foreign VPN. Um, you can also use Tor. Uh, Tor is fantastically effective at censorship circumvention. Um, but there are certain caveats. Uh, it is if, if you are the only person using Tor in your area, then it becomes very obvious to anybody monitoring the network that it is you using Tor, and you still are very uniquely identifiable. So uh, it's one of those things where there is safety in numbers. 
familiar with it. Uh, let's let's do a show of hands because I'm pretty sure this group is tech savvy. Raise your hand if you know what Tor is. All right, <laughs> we've saved ourselves a lot of trouble. Uh, Tor is um, is a anti circumvention tool. Uh, it is particularly effective at anonymizing your um, your web browsing. There's a whole lot of other stuff that it doesn't do, but that is something that it does especially well. The trouble with Tor is that it is slow. And so if you're you know, downloading video or something, or you're in a place where the internet is not very good, um, Tor is nearly unusable. And the other problem is that uh, the use of Tor in, um, is easy for, um, for the Russian government to detect. And since it is easily detectable, it is also easily trackable if there are not a whole lot of other people using Tor in order to give you safety in numbers. Um, there are also some very simple circumvention uh, technologies that you can use. Uh, for example, if you would like to circumvent a uh, Russian Twitter block uh, on Twitter, all you need to do is to change your location to some place outside of Russia. Uh, Twitter doesn't spend a lot of time advertising this, but I sure do. <laughs> And finally, uh, it's, uh, I strongly recommend using, uh, using encryption on your mobile phones. Uh, specifically, I recommend end-to-end -end encryption, both in, uh, it, well, in all of your communications. One particularly good tool for mobile end-to-end -end encryptions is uh, Signal, which is uh, an open source and free tool built by Open Whisper Systems. It will uh, give you end-to-end -end encryption for uh, phone messaging and also for, uh, for your phone calls. So go use that. And where, oh where, can you learn about all of these tools that you should be using and have uh, some you know, nice little tutorials on how you use them and have overviews on how you should be thinking about security and privacy? You can do this at Surveillance Self-Defense, which you can find at ssd.eff.org, uh, which yesterday we launched in Russian, which you can see up here. And you can get there by going to ssd.eff.org forward slash are you. Uh, we do not have this site available in Swedish at this time because the Swedes are not a particularly vulnerable population. So we, we chose to sort of prioritize uh, Thai and, uh, and other languages belonging to people who are, who are being targeted. Uh, but that definitely includes Russian. And so we have this wonderful resource for people who are looking for ways to, uh, to help Russians out. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the kind of activism that you and I can do every single day, very simply, as, as users of the internet uh, that would uh, help to fight uh, internet censorship and surveillance in Russia. Uh, the first thing that you can do is you can pressure companies and services to adopt HTTPS. And I'm talking about companies and services that are outside of Russia. I have already pretty much written off all Russian companies. Uh, even if Russian companies are using HTTPS, again, if the site is compromised, your data is compromised. You can also pressure uh, companies and services to adopt end-to-end -end encryption so that not even they can take a look at, uh, at the contents of your communications. That would sure be nice. Um, you can also pressure companies to publish transparency reports uh, like Google and Twitter and uh, some other companies. Uh, you can hold uh, companies accountable for the content of their transparency reports. And we talked about this a little bit earlier in the talk when I talked about the uh, taking, uh, about blocking uh, access to uh, Pravo y Sector. Um, so it's not enough that you tell me what you're doing. Somebody has to keep an eye on what you're doing and hold you accountable when you screw up. And finally, pressure companies and services to pull their employees and servers out of Russia. Because every server that you have in Russia and every person that you have in Russia, these are all potential, uh, these are all potential pressure points that the Russian government can use in order to uh, push your company into cooperating. Finally, I just wanted to evoke the, uh, invoke the principle of solidarity. Uh, the best thing that you can do in solidarity with users on the RUNET is to give them platforms that will not sell them out for ad money. Companies inside of Russia simply have too much at stake and are too easy to bully, but companies outside of Russia can take steps that will make it easier for them to hold up the principles of, speech, of free speech and privacy. They have to be willing to be blocked and to put the onus on censorship on the government rather than doing their job for them. So it's your job to remind companies that it's not just their Russian users at stake here. 
So that's what I think that you guys should go out and do, ideally immediately after this talk, maybe also after the next talk, maybe tomorrow, perhaps the day after tomorrow. Um, but uh, go out there and fight. Uh, and last of all, I wanted to uh, thank a couple of people whose work was really valuable to me in, uh, in putting this talk together. I wanted to thank Andrei Soldatov and uh, Irina Borgan from uh, the Sakharov Institute, who uh, have done so much great work on investigating um, state surveillance in Russia and are one of the one of the very few organizations that can still publish inside of Russia this kind of information. Uh, and finally, I wanted to thank Kim Carlson, who uh, did yeoman's work in making sure that the Russian version of surveillance self-defense was launched in time for today's talk. Thank you so much. Whoa, thank you. <laughs>